But first question I want to ask you guys is, uh, in your own words, uh, what exactly is SEO and why, why should it matter to a business owner? Joy, would you like to begin? Sure. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, I would probably describe SEO as the process of getting a website ranked well on search engines. Um, why a business owner would want to do it is um, it's like the number one most used places where people go to find information. Honestly, I don't really have to answer that question as much nowadays as I used to because everyone's already aware of why they need to show up well. But. Okay. Okay, so I guess like my definition of SEO would be uh, the process of making your site as relevant as possible for users and search engines so that your site shows up as the first search result or as high as possible. And the reason why businesses should, um, why it's important for businesses is because businesses generally, the purpose of them is to solve a problem that consumers have and then, then they get paid for it, right? So nowadays when a consumer has a problem, what do they do? They pull out their phone and Google it. So if you're number one on there, chances are you're solving a consumer problem and that's how you make money. <laughs> Anthony? Uh, yeah, so in my opinion, uh, SEO is pretty much the manipulation of Google's alg algorithm, because that's what you're doing. You're taking, like, you're taking your website, you're, you're making a few changes, you're going, uh, you're going externally, you're making backlinks. So you're pretty much playing the game so it favors you. And of course you have like, factors like quality and relevance that factor in as well. And why that would be important, that's, uh, it's, like, it's like really a low funnel, right? Like, Google, like people search all the time, like how do I do this? Or I'm looking for this, or blah, 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 101, or, um, or anything like that. And you, when the person is searching for something like that, then they're so close to the funnel that they're only one step away from like actually purchasing. So that's the main reason why I think SEO is important. Okay, just by show of hands, how many are completely new to SEO? Like you don't even know what the acronym is for, search engine optimization, raise your hands. Don't be shy, we all started somewhere. Okay, you're being a smart aleck. Okay, anyone else? Okay, and uh, how many of you guys uh, work in SEO and ex SEO tactics and strategies on a weekly basis? Could I see a show of hands? Oh, about a third of you, that's great. Um, do, do, I have some beginning questions, just some simple basic questions. What, what, uh, what would be um, important on-page factors if you wanted to uh, make a page rank for the keyword that you're targeting? Uh, can someone, don't, don't, don't hog the mic. Uh. Okay, so some basic on-page factors used to rank a site would be the title tag. Um, your H1 heading is usually the main heading of your page which Google uh, gives the most weighting towards compared to H2s or H3s. Uh, you also have your URL structure, so the slug in your URL, so you have your domain, .com, slash, whatever's in there is another ranking factor that they consider. So could you give us an example so people can visualize since we're losing lots of visuals today? Uh, sorry about that again. Could you give us a simple maybe doggy grooming or something? Uh, sure, so say you have a business called uh, Casanova, whatever. So your domain is casanova.com slash dog grooming, and your cert and that page specifically targets dog grooming. So by having the keyword in your slug, you help increase your uh, overall relevancy <laughs> of the page. Okay. So is a slug a pet, or what, what's a slug exactly? <laughs> I, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Could you paint a picture for us? It it's should be an acronym for your zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's basically the part of your URL that comes after your domain. Okay. And uh, other on-page factors would be include your content. So if your overall content is relevant towards your keywords, it, can, it contains the keywords and related terms. That will also help improve on-page relevancy. And also images is another factor. So you can also optimize your images by optimizing your file name and your alt text. Since Google can't actually determine what an image is, it relies on the alt text and image file name to determine its relevancy towards the page. So uh, alt tag is just uh, the naming of the image so that Google's uh, software can crawl it. Basically the naming or a description of the image even to describe it to Google. Okay, and then when you say title tags, is that what appears in the search engine? Uh, when, when, you, when I search dog grooming DVD, which, which part of the results is the title tag so everyone can yeah, so title tag would be the main headline in the search results page. It's basically the, also in your browser, in the top tab, that will display the title tag as well. And as well as that mentioned, it's within the search results page, so the main headline is your title tag there. 
Okay, and the meta description, uh, where does that come when you're searching for something on, on Google? So the meta description isn't actually a ranking factor, but it does help with improving click-through rates since it is essentially your ad copy. So that typically appears underneath your, uh, your title tag. And generally, Google gives you around 155, 156 characters or so to enter it in there. And Google will also occasionally, I guess, change up your meta description based on what they think is most relevant towards the user. So even if you set something as your meta description, if a, Google, uh, if a user search query targets a different word and your page pops up, your meta description may change based on that. OK. So uh, anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Okay, so before, before you continue with that, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, you want to know how your meta description and title tag can beat your competitors. No, 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 as I understand, the meta description is potentially used in your snippet, I think they, Google call it, uh, underneath your, the title on the search engine page. And they either, as you just said, use what you How do they decide which to use? And if they've chosen something else, how do you improve your description so that ultimately they pick what you describe to the page? Okay. So I guess it's really hard to, well, I guess the main way you would do is include your tar like, targeted keyword that you really want to rank for within the meta description. So since your keyword's already within the meta description, Google will probably see it as being more relevant and will likely choose that meta description that contains the keyword over some random snippet on the page instead. And if you, I'd just like to add, if you write the title tag and meta description as if it was an ad, so that when it shows up, even if you're in a lower ranking position than a competitor, more people will click it because it's more attractive because you're speaking to the needs. Because remember, they go to the search engine to solve a problem, right? And if you do that and you get a higher click-through rate, meaning more people click on your listing, then Google will automatically start moving you up on the rankings out, uh, outpacing your competitors. The title tag and the meta description. So if, if you write it so that more people click, then you'll 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 rise up in the rankings. Do you have any, anyone else have anything to add to that? Uh, I think Andrew. Actually, I have one more question. Sure, go ahead. Is it important to have your business name in the title, like your keyword main title, and then dash business name or? Don't fight, guys. <laughs> um, I usually tell my clients if they're a really well-known brand like State Farm, absolutely include it. If they're like a local dog kennel, no, it's a waste of space. So put, put it at the end. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if it fits, put it in. If you have a short business name, but often they're long and it's a really big waste of space if you're not well-known. But if you're State Farm, definitely include it. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll do a couple more in a second. Just I want to ask if you... Uh, currently, if you don't have a mobile-friendly site, does that affect rankings, guys? So I guess I can start. Um, so I haven't seen much of a decrease in people's rankings that don't have mobile-friendly sites um, ever since the whole mobile get-in thing that happened in the spring, if any of you guys heard about that. Um, I think it's definitely going to be more so in the future, but currently, not seeing much of a, a difference. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Joy. OK, it's just to add to that. Uh, the mobile getting thing, I guess, specifically targets mobile search results page. So if your site isn't mobile friendly, there's an increased chance of you maybe not appearing on a mobile device when someone searches for you. And with nowadays, with uh, most people, with mobile growing at least, right, I think it's one of the fastest growing uh, dev um, dev device of choice, right, that most people use nowadays. So by not having a mobile friendly site, you kind of risk not being as visible as you could be. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's move on. Um, how long does it take to take uh, to rank a, a page that, with a given target keyword? Anyone? Okay, I get the hard one. So. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So it obviously depends on the keyword you're targeting. So obviously, if you're targeting like car, you're probably won't rank number one no matter how big you are if you're not Wikipedia, right? So if it's something like I don't know, like vitamin C serum reviews or something like that. Something long tail, like lots of words. Yeah, something long tail. You know, you do all the like, on-page optimization right, 
You have like your title tags, your URL optimized. You do some backlinking like from author authoritative sites. Then it could probably take like two to three months depending like how crawlable the site is. That's the main factor. And um, yeah, and like how it's, mo it's mostly how competitive the keyword is. And like you just look at the front page, see like who's ranking. So if you see like blogs or like very small sites, then it's obviously easier to rank for. If you see stuff like Amazon.com or .ca or uh, any like very big like hard hitting sites, then chances are you it'll be harder. It's possible, but you know it's like a pu it's a push and pull with like volume and then competitiveness. Okay, so let's say uh, we want to rank for SEO expert Toronto, and I, I I hear that you're number one. Jeez, you actually know what you're doing. Um, what, do, what do you recommend? Well, how would you think about that page? How would you how would you write the content? How would you be how would you think about that process? Uh, to begin, first of all, I'm not number one anymore. <laughs> uh, Just number two now. Not I'm good. like I'm in the first page, okay. but like I'm number one for a uh, specialist. Okay. But because uh, that's what I'm targeting. But so like, then again, it's it's the same it's the same thing, right? You look at your front page. I think for Toronto SEO specialists, you have like all sorts of like small small other like other small consultants trying to rank for that key term. Essentially, it's just it's like a it's like a game, right? You're, tr you're trying to optimize your optimize your site a lot better than what the other guys are doing, and and it's all like key, uh, keyword research, right? Uh, I'm targeting Toronto SEO specialists. I could see some other guys tar targeting like SEO expert, but they're also raking for specialists. So I know I could take over specialists because they're not optimizing for that. Does that make sense? Right. So it's all just like looking at like, like the search landscape, seeing where everyone is located, see where you might fit in that, and see what like, it's, it's all like competitive analysis. Like look at their site, look at their title tags, look at their backlinks, see, determine why your site is better than that and how you can get it to that point. And with time then you can Okay. Hopefully, get there. So now you told us about how to start the process with a page. What what exactly is a back backlink to your your page? So a backlink is a link. So someone linking towards your site, your client site, or whatever site you're trying to optimize for. So let's say like uh, the the meetup page, right? It has my name on it, right? If I had a link that points to my personal domain, that would be a backlink. And I'm just hinting something, you know. <laughs> yes, for a backlink. Yeah. So, if you want to rank well for specialist as well as IT, expert, yeah. He ranks number one for both of them at the same time, the same page. Why is it difficult? Would you have to choose? Generally, you would have to choose, but uh, it also it, it, go, it goes a lot deeper into technical, like technical SEO and like keyword research. So, there's this thing called LSI keywords. So it's. So uh, what does that stand for? Yeah, it's uh, latent semantic indexing, I believe. Okay. And um, it's essentially associations of keywords. So as far as I'm concerned, and it might be pretty bad for me to give this away, consultant, specialist, and expert, they're semantically the same. They mean the same thing, right? Like everyone knows that. So, but that's why, like, when when you search like Toronto SEO specialist, or when I'm optimizing for Toronto SEO specialist, I still come up for expert and consultant, but I may not be the first one there. Right, so it is possible. It depends like how closely related the keywords are. Obviously, like if you're like like one like Toyota, and you're not going to rank for vi vitamin C serum, well maybe because it's like Toyota, but <laughs> like if if like the the keywords are like drastically different, then you're obviously not going to rank for it for both. Okay, thank you. Yes. Is a page rank important anymore? Like a few years ago. Like, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, PageRank is not updated anymore. Um, some may still see it as like a factor. Uh, page, so, so for those of you who don't know, uh, PageRank is is a is a value given by Google that determines the quality of your website from a search engine perspective. And as of I don't remember when they stopped it, like a few years ago, they stopped updating it. So. If you see a page rank, if someone says they have a page rank of four, and the last update was was like 2007 or something, then it's irrelevant. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Um, how important is updating content regularly? You mean for the pages you want to like, rank? Uh, just like blogging. Um, you know, I've heard different things that you got that Google looks for fresh original content, and if you do that, that will help your, you know, your domain. How valid is that? Uh, it's valid to a certain extent. Okay. Google does prioritize recent content, that's why like you'll see in the search results, especially for articles like particularly. So you'll see like the date of the article when it was posted. I think that's mainly what it applies for. But if you're just thinking of starting a blog for the sole purpose of improving organically in Google with no other like with no preparation and no strategy, then it's probably not gonna work out. So like Obviously, with every post, you need to optimize for like a particular topic for a particular keyword, and then like it also helps like to target like different topics that doesn't necessarily or that doesn't necessarily fit with your brand. So like, I'm just gonna go back to Toyota. So like, let's say Toyota is mainly like their nameplates, like the Corolla, Camry, so like stuff like that they rank for, but they can rank for maybe like mobile solutions or something. If they have a blog post about it, if they have like, so like it's a little bit far fetched, but I wouldn't necessarily say start a blog, you'll automatically improve SEO or something very generic like that. Uh, as far as uh, re re refreshing the content, um, if if you if you write something that the the visitors value that that's better than your competitors, a lot better, maybe ten times better, as Rand Fishkin likes to say, then you'll start you and, and you invite commentary on the bottom of your blog page and people keep finding your content and keep asking comments and adding to it, that itself gets refreshed and, and your content grows from those pages. So if we're gonna do anything, we're not, we don't wanna do it just for the sake of doing it. We need to have a purpose and we need to do it in a big way so that we can provide real value. Yes, back there. Yes. Explain that to us. Joy. <laughs> um, so the common thought reason um, is that they're trying to push AdWords more. That's what everyone thinks. Google has said absolutely nothing about why they did it. Um, it's a question I'm going to be asking them when I go to Google in October, because I want to know why, what they were thinking. Um, but yeah, the general consensus is probably so that they can push AdWords more, so that people can click on them more because they're more visible now that there's only three instead of seven. Um, I also have no idea why they would have removed the phone numbers from the results. It's just crazy in my mind, like why they would do that. Um, theories that I've heard is that they're trying to get more click data, and by having the phone numbers just visible there, people don't click, so Google doesn't know what happens, um, hmm. and they're not able to track that, which is a valid point. Um, but overall, I think most people, like 99% of people, hate the, the move from seven to three. What they should be thinking is that they just have been reading a bright local blog, mm -hmm. which I reviewed mm -hmm. two months ago. So, uh, and, and that's the latest blog. It was about talking about that, and I got it, but I didn't understand it. So, yeah. I think, I think they still need some of the blogs. Could you guys expand your question first? I have yes, no idea, so I have a lot. Step number four. Sorry? They thought it was more about for the seven to three. Oh, so, so um, for local searches, like if you search for a plumber in Toronto, for example, um, there you go, yeah, look at Colin's phone. <laughs> you get... So the pins used to be like A, B, C, D, all the way up to G, and now it's just A, B, C. Actually, I think the pin numbers are even gone now, but it's just three results on any computer worldwide, it rolled out overnight um, everywhere. Like it's not just Canada, US, it's everywhere. Okay. Um, because it's a small device like MP3. No, it's on computers now too. Uh, okay. okay. We have a question over there? Yep. Question for Joy. Uh, today I want to open up a service oriented business, local business across Canada. I need local numbers, local addresses. Is it best if I get a business address, a commercial address, a residential address, or a co working space? What type of business is it? Um, let's say plumber. Okay. So official Google rules is like in order to have an actual um, listing on Google, you do actually have to have an address. So if you're the business owner, you're allowed to use your residential address if you don't have an office. 
But if you had like 20 employees and you're like, ooh, each of you, you're going to use your residential address and we're going to set up listings for you. If Google catches you, they will blacklist all of them. Um, there are... Um, there's a community called Regional Leads that just started up that's a part of MapMaker, which is the back end to Google Maps, and they hate that. Like, they look for spam, um, even if it's hidden, because um, you can hide your address. They literally go out there, they look for it, they look for people that are breaking it. Google can track your IP address, so they can tell that you're the same person, yeah. even if you use different phone numbers. So let's, if I had an employee in DC and Vancouver, wants to open a shop there, mm -hmm. still use their address, as long as it's not a question of employees in one area? Technic Technically, yes, if he's like, you know, representing the business, you can maybe approach it that way. Um, I would just warn you never to log in from the same computer to his yeah. account, like have him set it up, because um, it's, it's kind of gray. You're not supposed to. Google would tell you no. If you ask Google, they would say no, it's just for the business owner. So if you're a plumber, okay. you're the owner, you can have one listing. Okay, but if you have a franchise, is there a place That'd be fine. Yeah, like a McDonald's is a franchise or whatever. They've got, you know, every McDonald's location has a listing. Um, and there are franchises, I'm sure, in like service area businesses as well. Right. So it's probably best residential over a co working space where the average is shared among a bunch of businesses. Yeah, shared offices can, can run into issues. Um, PO boxes, don't even think about using them. Virtual offices, stay away from. They're completely not allowed. Um, and it's easy for people to spot them. Um, but I would also be very careful with the residential thing because, like I said, if Google thinks that you're trying to manipulate it and breaking the guidelines, they can just yank them all at once. I've seen it happen many times. So I know we don't have a visual here, but uh, I think we need, need to explain the difference between uh, regular organic searches for general keywords and l keyword searches with local intent to give local SEO. Would someone like to just elaborate on that so it's clear to everybody? So it kind of looks like Colin's phone for those of you that were able to see it, but if you search Plumber Toronto, you will get um, three results that will be um, actual physical results that are like local places in Toronto beside a map. The map will try and pinpoint where they're all at, and then below that you get the organic results. Sometimes you'll get organic results, then the map, then more organic. Depends on which ranking signals are higher for which. Okay. Uh, next. Uh, I know we don't have time to talk about keyword research because we could probably do an entire session on that. But let's let's talk about maybe the thinking behind keyword research. Like if someone uh, had a business and they had a business service that they wanted to build a service page for and wanted to rank that, uh, can you guys add on how how they would begin that process of of, of finding the right keywords to use and and what the competitors are doing and stuff like that? Okay, so. At least for my keyword research process, what I like to do is, first of all, like I'll define the topic of my of my page. So I'll pick the general keyword of what it's about. And Can we use an example, the, maybe the dog thing again? OK, so again with dog grooming. So say I want to rank for a dog grooming service. That's what my page will be about. So that's the main keyword I'm be, I'll be focusing. So then after that, I'll start looking up related, uh, po possible related searches, such as, and other related terms, such as dog grooming shampoo, uh, brushes, stuff like dog grooming brushes and stuff like that, and just compile a huge list of related terms that could help support my main topic on my page. And after that, I'll probably go into, uh, I'll, sc I'll search my main term, look at my competitors' websites, see what keywords they're using on their page and how and what type of content they're using hmm. and keywords within their content. And just compile a list of those words. And then after that, I'll do a Google search result for some of these keywords like the main ones, and look at the bottom of the search results list where you see related searches. And back to what Anthony said, these are typically um, considered uh, LSI keywords or latent semantic indexing, and they're considered closely related or basically the same terms. So I'll get a huge list of keywords here and just run them through a tool like Google uh, Keyword Planner, get some estimated search volumes for them and see uh, how much monthly traffic they get and, which, and try to determine which one I would like to target more. So Keyword Planner is free, which is the best thing. And it's based on Google's AdWords data. So you can get a good idea of, of the, uh, I guess, the popularity of the keywords that you're picking as you're researching. Yes? Do you usually go for like high volume, low competition keywords? Uh, I guess it would depend on the type of site I'm working on. So like if I work on my own smaller sites who, that don't have much authority, I would typically choose uh, moderate volume, low competition. But if I'm working with a bigger client and I know I can rank for these bigger terms, 
then I'll tend to go for the more higher volume, um, moderate, high competition keywords. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to leave you alone here, Anthony. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, technical SEO and, and how that would work for a, a small to medium-sized business? I know you generally do enterprise, but I, I, does anyone here do enterprise businesses? Like, like a Remax or, or Beldec uh, Direct, anything like that? No? Okay, so let's, let's stick with small and medium for uh, technical SEO. Could you give us an idea of what you would think of and what kind of problems you usually come up with and like to solve? Yeah. How many of you use WordPress for your sites? Okay, could you talk about WordPress SEO specifically? Okay. Okay. Um, so if you guys are using WordPress, then like 90% of you are probably using Yoast, which is an SEO plugin. For those of you, yeah, like Y-O-S-A-S-T. Yeah, something like that. I don't use WordPress. Like Toast. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to get to it. <laughs> so Yoast is a plugin for WordPress. Uh, you can pretty much edit as far as anything's, con like, anything's concerned for WordPress, like titles. Uh, you can, actually, you probably know WordPress SEO more than me. I'm going to pass it off to Andrew. Yeah, so with the Yoast plugin, you can basically edit all of your on-page uh, elements in like one easy, uh, simple user interface. So I guess what it looks like is once it's installed and you have a blog post or a page, at the bottom, or towards the bottom, there'll be a small Yoast box where you can enter in your custom title that you want to display in SERPs, and uh, your meta description. And basically, they also have a ranking factor on there too, so when you enter in a keyword, it tells you they give you a grade on like how well or how good your on-page elements are in regards to that keyword and I guess how you're optimizing for it. So it's really like an easy SEO tool to use to kind of, for beginners, you just enter in a keyword and um, optimize your page towards it based on Yoast's recommendations. Does it work? Yeah, it works pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yes. So my recommendations in regards to WordPress and plugins is try to use the bare minimum as possible. Like I know for some of our client site, we try to keep it to Yoast, maybe uh, a protection or security plugin, and any like forms, custom forms and stuff. And then anything else, we can try to code it in uh, into the theme and whatnot, rather than using plugins to make everything. Because when you have 50 plugins and they're all doing different things, things break easily. Okay. Any more questions about WordPress SEO? Okay. Um, so guys, if if you if you wanted to uh, get together all these related keywords that you were talking about, what if we created a big long page with all these related keywords? Can we rank for all of them, or is there like how does that work? Can you can you just build like a big giant page and then? that's bigger than all your competitors with all these keywords stuffed in it, or was that a bad recommendation? So I guess this is kind of similar, going back to what Anthony said about ranking for SEO expert, specialist, and consultant. So you can have all these words on your page, but you can't exactly optimize the best for all of them. You, can, you have to pick, kind of pick one and choose. So like you'll, you might appear for some of these other terms, but chances are a competitor could probably optimize better for that specific term that you're not optimizing for, and they may rank better in that sense. But by having all these related terms on your page, you can still improve your search visibility. But again, you might not rank for all of them, or rank first for all of them. Yes? How about splitting that page into four, not in four areas, so that makes sense? Yeah, so say you have a service of some sort, right? Uh, so you have dog grooming, dog bathing again, uh, dog haircuts, whatever. So rather than keeping them all on the same page, you could have four or three or four separate service pages and focus each of those pages specifically on that keyword or topic, and you'll have a better chance of ranking each individual page rather than one, one page for everything. Okay. Uh, yes, the person at the back. Yeah, uh, if your competitor is using like invisible, like P tags in the H1, that's unethical. Uh, would, does Google have some sort of vetting for that? Sure. Okay, so there, there are penalties for it. So what he's describing is called cloaking. Well. Not links, but so 
He says, so his competitor, the competitor that he's talking about is hiding links with the CSS file. So let's say he's targeting dog training brushes, and he has all sorts of tag, like p tags and alt tags with pretty much repeating dog training brushes, and he's hiding it with CSS so the, the average user is not being, being able to see it. So there are penalties to uh, uh, penalize that. So some of you may know like the Google Panda algorithm, which like, specifically targets like, unethical things like that. So if he is, if he is ranking like, like currently, then chances are he won't rank long. And if you just build like, a, better, a better page that's properly optimized, it's not using unethical tactics, then, and you're also linking, then you should, like that's, that's a very like 2002 tactic. So it, it won't, generally won't happen in like this day and age. And I just want to add, if, you, if we want to build businesses that have longevity, then we, we need to stay away from any tactics that, are, are, are sh that give you short-term gain because th th the end result is not good and you, you're going to have to probably close up shop and build a new business. It's just not worth the hassle. Yes? What are those tactics just to like, stay away from? Uh, st okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Like, you know, we always should have a list of uh, do nots. So how about some big do nots, guys? Let's go around. Cloaking, we just talked about. Do not hide stuff that people can't see in the eye, but the, 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 the Google's robots can crawl. Don't do stuff like that. What else? So I guess a big one is do not build spammy backlinks. So like, if you can get a site, just because you can get a backlink doesn't mean you should get it. So like if you have a backlink from say like a dating site or something, when your service is dog grooming again, there's no correlation there at all, and it's pro and it's probably not worth it. And yeah. Do you want to? Sure. Um, yeah, I know a big one that um, I see done a lot with clients is um, anchor text is a big thing that a lot of SEO people care about, which is the words that you hyperlink to your site. So um, if there's an article written about you and the word dog training is linked to your site that tells Google, oh, you're a dog training site. A lot of people do that, but they do it in mass, and they'll go out and like every single site, they have the exact same word, um, like dog training, Florida is the word, let's say. They've got like t nine or 10 of those exact same phrases linking to their site. It's unnatural, it's not normal. Usually people use different variations, like dog trainer in Florida, or dog trainer FL, or different variations. So when Google sees patterns where it's like the exact same wording over and over and over again, that's normally one of the things that can trip the Penguin algorithm which fights backlink spam. And, and to talk about don'ts again, um, and longevity and building real businesses that provide value to people, um, Google has probably hundreds of engineers. We can't beat them. So mm -hmm. let's just stay on board and create value and, and think of the customer. Like, what can we do that, that is, it, that's going to be so definitive for a customer that they don't want to go anywhere else? So we just always think quality. We won't have to worry about the, these borderline tactics. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the Panda update. And uh, since then, two-part question. What I've been hearing a lot about is that it's moved to more content is king. Content is your most important part. But A, do you guys agree with that? And then B, what are you finding is the better way to build a backlink without being spam? For not so much for you guys as SEO experts, but for a business that isn't necessarily in the SEO industry. I guess I could, I could take that one. Uh, when we talk about off-page SEO and we talk about backlinking, you always want to be relevant. Like if you're a, a uh, women's clothing business, you don't want to get uh, backlinks from, I don't know, kids' uh, toys, Toys R Us and stuff like that. It's not relevant, right? And you also want to get links from sites that are co local or community-based if you're a local business. So just keep, keep it the same theme. And if you do bridge out in more generally, uh, don't don't go too far so that it that it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, yes. Do you ever recommend like a link exchange between? Um, I'll give you my PayPal email later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So for for the first question, that's very that's very um, subjective, because. Uh, 
in the search engine eye, in the search engine's eyes, it can't really tell. Like, if, especially if done right, it can't really tell whether the link has been exchanged like on purpose. Like, other than the fact that you have a backlink to her site or his site and a backlink to yours, because you you guys may you might you guys may actually be relevant to each other. So, and it also depends on the anchor text. So. But generally, like obviously, like the Google the Google answer would be no. They want they want links that's organically, organically created, linked to just great content stuff that people want to share and link to. Well, if you have like um, like a local business and they have affiliated businesses that have their own sites and they exchange links. If if you're Okay, uh, if you're a small if you're a small business, I highly like, I highly recommend you don't you don't do that. Really? Yeah, if you're a bigger business, like obviously enterprise level, you can get away with it because like it's it's skewed, right? So like going back to Toyota, like they can do that. I don't know if like, and I don't think they do, but if you're a smaller business, you're at a higher you have a higher chance of being penalized. Because you you have you have a smaller site, so you have you have less room to maneuver. Yeah. Do you mind if I add that? Yeah. Um, kind of a white hat sort of way that I do that is through testimonials. So, for example, I have a client who's a dentist. He wrote us a fantastic testimonial, which we wanted to feature on our website. Yeah. So we linked back to him, gave him a link. Like, why not? So I know small businesses I work with. I tell them to do that a lot. We reach out. Um, you know, if you've got like a, a dentist and an orthodontist and they refer business to each other all the time and they will recommend each other, do it publicly on their website. They can, you know, give each other a testimonial and link back to each other and that's a really white hat way of doing it. Yeah. Or a review or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Okay, so does everyone know that links, uh, whether it's from another site or in your own site, it, it gives a vote of confidence and, and authority to your page that you're trying to rank for? So you want to have links from other sites that are related. And then uh, this relates to a question that we have for um, internal linking, like pages linking within your own site. What is the general best practices, guys? Uh, sure, I'll take this one. So uh, internal links are basically links within your own site that point to other pages within your site. So what this does is uh, when you acquire backlinks, uh, page authority and I guess general uh, yeah, general authority is passed towards your site and that page specifically. So by linking to other pages within your site, it passes the link juice or link value towards these deeper pages on your site. So generally what you want to do is have your main service pages or your main landing pages uh, accumulate the majority of this link value so that they're given the most authority and have a higher chance of ranking for, the, uh, for your terms that you're targeting. Okay, so if I have three service pages, let's say, let's say I'm an immigration lawyer and I do, I don't know, uh, a, spe a specific Canadian type visa, a student visa, and a, a, and a US uh, visa, and I have these three, and I have blog posts and I have other pages, are you saying that I should internally link them to these three service pages? Yeah, so the thing with the blog posts is they're a great way to capture traffic from keywords that you may not that you may not actually target a specific landing page for. So like say there's a current news topic or something that's being searched a lot about, you may want to make a blog post for that that ranks and then gets traffic. And what you can do that with that blog post afterwards is use that to funnel more traffic back towards your landing pages by including an internal link to your landing pages. And if other people link to your news blog posts, uh, that, page would, that blog post would gain authority as well and it gets passed back towards the service pages afterwards. Okay. Any, any questions? Yes, sir. Is it a friend of like Google if you have the exact same anchor text on multiple pages pointing towards one page? Uh, or should you mix it up a little bit? Just yeah, so generally you want to make, similar to uh, backlinks in their anchor text, you want some variety there. So if you have too much exact match, I believe I read reports of people getting penalized for spammy internal linking even. So you want to mix up your anchor text uh, and vary it based on, uh, again, you can use like LSI keywords and uh, just related terms that mean, mean similar <laughs> things to link back to your service pages. Okay, so we're just gonna take one more question. We're gonna take a 10 minute break and, uh, and there's, uh, there's refreshments and, and a little bit of food and then we'll, we'll do a, an another session and finish off the night. Yes, sir. So continuing on, on the internal link topic, does that mean is it a bad idea to have 
have a one-page sign. Nowadays, you see a lot of them. Your, your about us, your service, your other things are all on the same page. They look very sleek. You just scroll down, you get all the information. Does that mean you get penalized in terms of SEO? Uh, well, I guess it kind of depends. But in general, I believe Google prefers bigger, more authoritative sites. So if all your content is within one page, chances are you won't, because you only have one single page, you only target so many keywords on that one page, and chances are it won't rank for a variety of terms. So I guess, in a sense, you d that's not a practice that I would recommend, having only one page. But they probably also have blog pages, you know, stuff like that, but their main website page is just one page, a very long page. So those are called parallax websites, where there's just one scrolling page. You can program it in a way that Google will understand that it's separate pages, but it's very technical. Just remember that Google indexes and, and ranks web pages, not websites. So for each page, for each keyword that you want to rank for, you want to have a dedicated page for it under, under general best practices. I understand under the UX experience that sometimes you want a website like that. It's a little sexy and it's a small website and just scrolls. Mm -hmm. But for most people, that it would be very difficult and technical for them to do it. But you can do it, it's, but the other way, for most of you who are small business owners or working on small business websites, you want to have a page per keyword that you're trying to rank for. Okay. What could do with that type of site, I'm actually working on a site like that right now, just designed it. Um, so it's one page, but we also have the nav bar across the top, so each page will also, like everything that's in there will have its own page as well. It's basically it's a cache program to communicate that, that they're showing that each one's actually a standalone page. Yeah. But visually it looks visually, like to the user that yeah. it's one. So there is a way to do it, but that's getting super geeky. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll take a 10-minute break, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue. Okay, guys. Uh, if, if we, now, now that we, we've picked, we've done some keyword research, we, we picked a, a page, the keywords that we want to target for our business services, um, what, what do you recommend? How do, we, how do we spy on competitors? Like, what, what kind of things can we look for when we look at a, com a competitor and how we can do better, a better job, build a better mousetrap? Okay. okay, so for some tools you can use to spot competitors, uh, there's this tool called SEM Rush, I believe, where you type in a URL and it will tell you what terms are driving traffic towards that site. So you can use that tool to get a quick snapshot of keywords that your competitors are ranking for. Is it free? Uh, there's a free ver like there's a free version. SEM Rush free version. It's okay. yeah, yes. It's limited, but it can still give you some results at least. So it's better than nothing. Okay, so you can spy on them that way. Anything else? Uh, if you want to look at their backlinks to kind of get a comparison to see, or to find some backlinks that you could acquire yourself. So say like there's some community site that links to all lawyers and you're not on there but your competitor is, you can use a tool called, you can use a link tool such as Ahrefs or uh, Majestic SEO to kind of get a snapshot of their link backlink analysis and see where they're getting links from and what sites you could uh, reach out to to try to get a link back from as well. Okay. And uh, next, next week, we're going to have a recap uh, blog post. So we'll have everyone's information here, the Twitter information. So you, you can bug them and expand on this. So don't feel like, like uh, there wasn't enough tonight. Go, yes, Can go I ahead. Ask one burning question? Sure. If you take over an SEO account, for example, and they have a whole bunch of backlinks. And I know you said make sure they're relevant. So when do you know this about? And when do you, like, when do you, you know, what's your policy? What would you, assuming you're, you have the long game in mind? Okay, I, I would like to defer this question to our VP of Sales and partner at, at Power Search because he's a disavow king. He's disav he's disavowed probably three dozen websites. So Matthew, well, what what would you do if you took on an account and it has a, a, a million links and it's just all over the place? How how would you trim that down? How would you make sure that you don't get penalized? Sure. So, so great, great question. Um, so, what you would do is you wouldn't disavow anything unless you have a penalty. So, you can just if you don't have Google Webmaster Tools set up on your website, um, you'll want to do that and verify it. Um, and then in there, they're going to let you know if you have a penalty or not from bad links. Now, if you have bad links, then yes, you probably need to go through. If it's if it's a penalty that has to do with um, with, with linking schemes. Uh, and they'll tell you literally that it's it's due to having bad links, and they'll even show you a couple examples. Now I've done a. a does anyone in here have a penalty? You, you have a penalty. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
is it is is it on links? Uh, yeah, I did a disavow list um, quite a while ago. Are, are you out of the penalty yet? Um, I've not, no, I never got a recovery. You haven't got a recovery. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. How long is it? How, how long has it been I think that you've had it? A year ago, I did the uh, disavow. Okay. I had a, a lot of bad links that I. Sure. So you just bought, you, you bought, bought, did you do them, or did you buy them from like Fiverr or? Um, like Scrapebox and stuff. Scrapebox. Okay. I love Scrapebox. Scrapebox is a great <laughs> tool uh, when used well. Um, so it's it's a fantastic tool, but it can also be a dangerous tool if you don't know what you're doing. So you know you can if you if you if you want afterwards I can tell you a little bit more about how to getting out of it. But honestly, it's not hard to remove a penalty anymore. I, I have done a bunch of them, and from doing. Um, uh, a few of them that took a little bit longer. I've learned a few things on how to just sort of get out of it in probably under 60 days, if not maybe 30 days. It's not, I can't promise you this, but what you need to do is invest in a tool like Link um, Research Tools. It's a great tool. Um, it's not free. It's it's about $500 a month, I think, but for, or $300 a month for this multiple. But just go in there, dump all your links in there, and it'll automatically go through and sort them through sort of risky, uh, medium risk and then the good ones and what you're going to want to do is you're going to it's look at it like this don't try and get a disavow by using a scalpel and taking a few links away at a time literally just hack off the limb just submit all your crappy links even if you're even if you think that they're good links I really wouldn't worry about them they're probably not passing as much value to you as you think they are uh, you know you probably want to go through you know so, some you know through some of the the medium links to just make sure that they're not some quality links. Like sometimes it might catch something like your Facebook page. Don't submit your your Facebook page to <laughs> this valid list. You know what I mean? Like go through it and scan it and take a look at it. And another way to look at it is anchor text. Like look at the links where it's like exact match anchor text. That's probably why you got penalized because you what I don't what keyword were, what's your main keyword? What's your business? Uh, well, the uh, website center around prostate cancer and. Okay, so, 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 oh, menopause, menopause. So a lot of search volume around that big, big business. So you know, you probably have a hyper, you know, anchor text that just says prostate cancer, and it's just, and if you just look at all those links, those are probably all the crappy ones. Get rid of those right away, and then submit your disavow, and you'll probably get out of it. And one of the things you don't need to do that a lot of people make a mistake of, is you don't. Honestly, in my experience at this point, you do not need to do outreach to the other webmasters. Google's going to tell you, oh, reach out to all the webmasters and show us that you put effort into getting rid of these links. Eh, no, wrong. You know what you do? Instead, just go to Majestic SEO or, or Ahrefs if you're really concerned about it, but you honestly, they don't look at this document that you submit them. I guarantee you they don't because... Google, if they had to automate, you know, if they, if they had to look at everything, they, just, they would completely go out of business. They wouldn't be able to have the labor force to support it. It's just they're looking to see if the crappy links got removed. If they got removed, they're going to remove it. But if you do and you want to show them that, go to Ahrefs and just show all the drop links and then put, put it in a spreadsheet in a Google Share doc and just say, yeah, we, we got these removed. You think they really care? They, they don't care. They're not looking at it. So just, just be aggressive about your disavow, submit it, and, and, and go from there. For finding your backlinks? Yeah, yeah, Google Webmaster Tools. Well, Google, well, Google Webmaster Tools, you need to be connected to the know if you have a penalty. What was the website? The, the other one is Link Research Tools. Is, is that, that's going to help you classify your links into, they have something that's called a detox report. You just honestly put your website in there. You don't even have to add your websites. Click one button, come back 15 minutes later, or depending how many links, backlinks you have, uh, and it's going to classify them into three categories: so healthy, moderate, and high risk. And you want you want to really look at the moderate, high risk links. And you said there was a website that told you if you had a penalty listed or not. So so your penalty will your penalty you know if it was lifted or not because Google's going to tell you. So when you submit your disavow and your re reconsideration request. Google's going to tell you whether you still have it or not. It'll be in your Google Webmaster Tools. Okay. So if you, I, I don't, you just because if you have more questions at the end, or if anybody's a penalty. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay. So let's go back to competitors, spying on competitors. When we're trying to spy on competitors for ranking a local business, what would you do, uh, Joy, in looking at competitors and you want to rank for your business and, and, and beat them? So um, there is a tool out there that Bright Local has. Is it, is it free? It's not free to my knowledge. Is there knowledge. a free tool that someone can use here? Is there free? For, for, for local? 
Local competitors. Free tool? I don't know of a free one. Okay. Other than manually looking, um, you can um, the the one that Bright Local has is the Google Plus Local Wizard is the name of it. Uh, I don't honestly know what it costs because it comes with a subscription, but um, it'll tell you all the categories that the businesses are targeting. If you're targeting them, how many reviews they have comparison to you, how many photos in comparison to you. We use it a lot with clients. Uh, the biggest thing is categories. So if you didn't have the tool, I would just go through each listing and see what categories they're targeting. Um, the only thing is make sure you actually click on the categories because Google only displays two, um, but you can have up to 10. So um, if you hover, or not hover, but if you click on the actual thing, it'll list them all. If you click on the category, um, it'll list all the ones on there. So just don't oversee that. Okay, thank you. In the break, I had someone ask if, if someone wanted to begin learning about SEO and local SEO, do you guys recommend some uh, some blogs or, or some sites or that people can get some basic information, not not really too advanced, something they can slowly digest and get into it? I would go with Moz. Moz. Yeah. Moz. Yeah. So I guess if you want to learn uh, SEO in general, one of the best ways to learn is read up on guides on Moz uh, Search Engine Journal, I believe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, also, like the best way to apply what you learn is just to make your own website. That's what both me and Anthony did uh, when we were in university. We just created a website, uh, read up a bunch about SEO, and applied the tactics there on your own site. Since it's your own site, like you don't have to worry about losing prop money or not. Because if you're working on a client site and you mess up something, like that's a big <laughs> red flag, right? <laughs> but if you're working on your own site, you have the freedom to experiment and try what, and to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So it's like your own test playground. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Would you suggest looking on Twitter on accounts like Growth Hacker? For, for SEO, SEO information? information. Uh, yeah, Growth Hackers has some uh, good posts uh, here and there in regards to SEO. But they also focus on a lot of other uh, areas of digital marketing as well, right? OK. Um, how do you guys think about, um, how would you think about SEO when you're creating content? Like, because uh, there's a lot of talk about content is king, and we got to create epic content, and 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 we got to create lots of it, and everyone's stressed out about it. I'm sure. Uh, how do we put uh, an SEO perspective so that we're we're not um, wasting our time? Uh, well, I guess with SEO and just optimization in general, or what Google wants is to serve the most relevant content as possible to its users, and be as user friendly as possible, right? So, in regards to content, I would keep that in mind and try to write for the user. Don't write keyword stuff content, uh, trying to rank for it by having high keyword density and whatnot, since Google doesn't like that, since they know it'll be crap to the user. So they wouldn't, you wouldn't be ranking well for that type of content anyways. Okay, are there any questions? Yes, sir. How do you deal with stupid content? For example, you write an awesome blog post on your website. You okay. want more people to see it. Okay. So you post it on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on all the other social media sites. So in terms of SEO, does that help you or punish you? Anyone? Uh, well, normally the way you deal with duplicate content is with a rel canonical tag. So it tells you which is the original version of your content. But again, with Facebook, you can't really edit their code and whatnot to include that. But um, I figure for the most part, <laughs> want to take this? Oh, oh, it, can, I, can I ask a clarification? Are you saying that you built a page and then you're just sharing on different social platforms? Or are you saying that you built multiple pages that are almost exactly no, the same we're content? we're talking about pages. We're talking about blog posts. You know, just an article that you write, right? So you're just sharing it on Facebook? Yes. Oh, that's, yeah, that's not, fine. That's fine. Uh, does, does, is it that you the content? No, not at all, because you're linking back. You're just linking to the no, source. No, 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 no. You put the text on the other sites as well. Always I'm link just, back I'm to it. Link. Because, um, um, for example, on LinkedIn, you can mm -hmm. share the same article on your profile, right? Mm -hmm. To show your expertise, blah, blah, blah. And then on Facebook, you can post the whole uh, text as well. And usually, that's the, the preferred way to do it, because people don't usually click on it and arrive on your website to read it. They want to read it right there. So, but that actually introduced the problem I was thinking about. Does that count as duplicate content in Google's eyes? Just link back to the source, as long not as the just, very bottom. Like just. I, I think, oh, okay. uh, uh, am I understanding correctly? That are you saying that uh, because now link, LinkedIn and, and uh, Facebook allow you to publish content, are you talking about publishing the same article on those platforms and on your site? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. Oh. It, it's your platform, right? You are allowed to do it. It's your profile, it's your article. 
Then why not? Uh, let, let's, let's, let's go to the top of the top of the, our SEO <laughs> expert here, <laughs> our CEO. <laughs> uh, so the rule of thumb is he or she who publishes it first is the author of it. Okay. So choose the domain in which you will get the highest, most relevant audience. Publish your content over there, and then you can republish it elsewhere. And Google will understand at that point of time that it, even though those are duplicates essentially, that you are the owner of that content, okay? Um, you can take it a step further and do what Joy said, which is in the republished versions, you can link to the authoritative version of the content to give Google another signal. I'll give you an example. So I blog on medium.com sometimes. Um, and I do that because the audience on Medium, well, just they get, I get a lot more readership than I do on my personal blog. But then what I do is I also republish that on LinkedIn. I also post it on my personal blog, for Let's example. Yeah. And that's completely okay. But at the bottom, I'll usually add in, say, originally published on Medium. And what that does is it builds a backlink from wherever I republished it back to the original source that I'd like to rank. And the reason why I do that on Medium rather than on my own blog is because A, it gets more readership, B, it's a more powerful domain than my own personal domain. So you can choose where you want to publish. It doesn't actually necessarily have to be on Facebook. One thing you should remember about Facebook, by the way, is that if you publish on Facebook, it's not necessarily always that it'll get indexed by a search engine. Most of Facebook is actually not indexed by search engines. Okay. If you post it on a Facebook page, then yes. If you post it on your Facebook profile as public, then yes. But typically, it's not indexed. Okay. Um, if you publish it on LinkedIn using their blogging tool, then yes, it, it will get indexed by search. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think that's a very good answer. But the, the key question is still, how do you market so the uh, the search engines know? This is just a repost from your original content, other than just bottom. So step bottom one, link. Yeah. publish it on the, on the platform that you wish to be considered authoritative, where whatever that might be for you, whatever you consider important. Step two, when you republish it elsewhere, link from that republished content back to the original authoritative version. Okay, so that would be the answer on how you, you would go about telling or giving the search engine a signal that this is a copy of that original piece of content. If, if you wanted, so if you put it on your website as well, just to add to what Jeff's saying, in Google Webmaster Tools, you can actually, if you want to make sure that Google finds it first before that it came from your website as the original source of the first publishing. Because sometimes you can, if your website's not authoritative enough, it doesn't get crawled as quickly as yeah. maybe yeah. putting on something on LinkedIn that gets crawled all the time. Yeah. You can go to Google Webmaster Tools and put in your blog post and ping it right there and they'll find it right away and they'll know that's the original source that it was published at. Now just note that duplicate content is not an issue on different domains. It's only an issue if it's on the same domain. So don't worry about any, if you have duplicate content, if it's on different sites, don't, don't worry about it. If it's on the same domain, it's a problem. Mm, okay, uh, the same yes. Same IP, is that the same? Yeah, same, same IP, same, same domain. IP. Same, same, same domain, you know, because you can have a subdomain and it would be considered a brand new domain, but yeah, IP and domain. Okay, I just want to go slightly off topic for this next question to Anthony because Anthony is an expert in a, uh, app optimization and I believe there are a lot of articles coming out lately that, that this is going to be the new SEO in the future because more people are spending more time on apps and, and they'll be spending less time on search engines. So Anthony, can you speak to like what you see, since you're doing it right now, what do you see for the future of like small and medium-sized businesses and, and apps uh, for their customers and, and, and how would you optimize for that? So like optimizing apps or? Well, what would what, what you do with them? Like uh, are you, just, just give us a little like brief summary. Okay, so if you have an app that you're trying to market, then. Use Tinder. That's it, okay. <laughs> Okay, let's say, let's say you own Tinder and you want to market Tinder on the App Store. So, uh, there, so, <laughs> so there are two different algorithms you deal with when dealing with apps. So you have the Google Play Store and also the Apple App Store. So they, they both take different types of factors. As far as I'm concerned for the Apple, Apple App Store, it's uh, the keywords that you add in. So there's an option to add key, like a list of keywords separated by comma and you're limited by characters. It's the, and it's the title, the amount of downloads you get, 
and the reviews and ratings, and that's it. Like nothing in the, de in the description, nothing with anything else, it's just those factors. And with Google Play, it's a little bit more, uh, you have a little bit more to play with, so it's description, you have the title, some, there's some speculation whether it's the developer company name that factors in as well. So uh, yeah, so just keep in mind that you're dealing with not just like the, the I, I, iTunes App Store, you're dealing with the Google Play Store if you're listening on both stores. Okay. A any any questions? We're gonna we're gonna close this off now. So any last questions? Yes. How do you measure the ROI of SEO for your clients? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, for me, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So, and it's all, so when, when dealing with a new client, it's like 95% of it's educating them. And like the other 5% is defining your goals, defining what they expect and what they can expect at the end of the contract. So obviously it's gonna be different for each person. One person might want, yeah, I want 100% guaranteed rank for, uh, best dating site on Google. And there will be people out there who say they will guarantee that, like 100%. Should you go with that person? Probably not. And there's some person, there's other people who might say, yeah, I just want like an X percent increase in uh, find a store, right? So it, it all depends. Um, I can't really. So you don't say like, you know, we will get you on page one for this search term. Okay. You know, in six Okay, so a, a caveat to this, we, we do deal with a lot of businesses. Do not make any guarantees. Do not, for the life of you, just to try to get a deal, please. Long, long term, folks, quality. Don't make any guarantees. You don't control Google, and they definitely do control us to a certain extent, so let's stay away from that. Anyone else about ROI on SEO, measuring ROI? I wrote a blog post, um, probably it's like the fifth or sixth oldest post on Imprezio Marketing's blog. Um, it's more geared towards local businesses, but there's some stuff in there that would apply regardless. It's like 17 tips on measuring ROI for local SEO. A um, couple I'll mention, biggest thing for us is screenshots. Before and after screenshots are huge. So like if you have a business that has like no optimization done and they show up really terribly on Google, um, I show like a before screenshot, then after I make them a really nice title tag that has like an awesome call to action, looks amazing compared to their crappy competitors and stuff. I, sh I show them before and after. That was one big thing. Um, dynamic call insertion has been a lifesaver for some clients. So if you're not using that, it's amazing. Yeah, and you can specifically say you want to track certain things and not others. Um, so that's a big lifesaver as well. But I find it's more about the reporting when it comes to ROI, like in basing it on what the customer wants um, to see, like knowing what their objectives are beforehand. Um, we customize all our reports there. We don't have like a automated thing. Um, so I think that's one of the key things that works. And I'd like to add to that, so, sometimes before we even begin talking about ROI and, and what people get from it, you need to have a baseline. So you have to measure everything possible. So guys, get your client sites onto Google Analytics, webmaster, Google Webmaster Tools or, or Search Council, now it's called. Uh, get the call tracking, get the forms, track everything you can in every way possible so that you can actually tell the client, because they're gonna give you feelings sometimes. Like, I don't feel like it's busy enough. I don't feel, and then you, 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 don't get, you don't get upset. You just say, hey, you know what? That's great. Let me show you what happened last month. And then you have all the proof. So you gotta track everything before we can even talk about ROI. Okay, so that's, any more questions? <laughs> Uh, track your, your forms, the form fills. So you're tracking the phone calls, you're tracking people filling out the forms. You probably want to track different things on your site, like people clicking uh, or filling up a subscription, the, the email, um, you know, downloads if you have like white papers and stuff like that. How, how many of you have set up goals and analytics? How many of you, keep your hands up please. Um, how many of you have set up goal values and analytics as well? Okay, some people. Not so much. So that's the dollar value, basically, of the goals. Because a lot of people will set up goals and just be lazy and say, ah, it's worth a dollar. <laughs> and it's not worth anything, basically, at that point in time. So think about sort of your goal values. And if, you're, if you want to share your clients' reports or an ROI, that's a good place to start where 
you basically say, look, here's the actual dollar value of leads or interactions or whatever it is for the business that you're working for or with uh, is worth. And that's a, a nice, easy way to kind of skip past all the technical stuff and just say, here's what the real business impact was. Okay. Can you tell people how to get a goal value? Yeah, sure. So it comes from asking the right questions. Um, you need to understand a couple of things. What is an average customer worth to the business that you're working with? Um, how many of leads, for example, or how many visitors do you need before you get a sale? And then you divide that number. So for example, if an average customer is worth $1,000, let's say you're working with a real estate lawyer, for example, $1,000, and then they need 10 leads to be able to score one sale, maybe because their salespeople suck, and then nine of them basically just say, nope, I'm not willing to pay $1,000, right? So then if you get a lead, you're basically taking $1,000 divided by 10, now a lead is worth $100 essentially, okay? So if somebody fills out a form that says, I'd like to, I don't know, close a house for example, um, and that lead gets registered, that lead is now worth $100 as a goal value. So now if you end up having 50 of those leads, you do 50 times 100, okay? And now you've generated you know, $5,000 worth of value for your client, okay? Very, very easy to demonstrate that way, but you can't come up with a number if you don't know the average sale value and you don't know how many of those attempts you basically need in order to secure the sale. Okay. Well, um, I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Oh, sorry. One last question. Go ahead. Uh, no, just to, uh, you guys have been focusing on Google. Like, what about Bing? Okay. Well, right. Well, right. Well, right now, right now, uh, we have some friends that work at Microsoft, and it's it's very sad. But anyways, um, the, 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 I'm ex-Microsoft, so in 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 Canada, they claim to have about 10% uh, of search, and then in the U.S., somewhere around 30%. So if that's worth the time and, and effort to you then go ahead, it just depends, it really depends, and it just depends on your, your customer base. I mean, they claim to have an older, uh, more, uh, I guess, a richer demographic, uh, people that have pre-installed browsers, maybe. Uh, so uh, you just, you have to assess your situ specific situation. I wanna thank everyone for coming tonight. We really appreciate your attendance, and thank you for the speakers.